20. Matthew chapter 20. I think there's 20. Yeah. And if not, we're going to turn there anyways. Matthew chapter 20. We're going to look at verse 1 through 16 here tonight. Laborers in the vineyard. The last parable. Nobody clap. Nobody clap. The last parable. And then uh, next, uh, next week we'll start the... Uh, Super Summer Wednesdays with the preachers. I believe uh, Brother Metlock is the first one up starting next week. Uh, and then I think you got the brother from uh, Allen Park, uh, Mayberry, uh, the week after that. Uh, so, But the list is on the door. Uh, there's actually one on that door as well as far as uh, who's, who's teaching and when they're teaching. And, and on the bulletin board. So. But uh, so I'll close out the, the parables uh, here tonight. Uh, but before I do start... Um, Jim actually reminded me, because uh, I didn't even really realize it, that uh, this upcoming week starts the new quarter. So the women uh, have the women's class that's going to be starting, I believe, on Sunday downstairs. Uh, uh, so that's going to be happening. Um, we were teaching Timothy up here, but being that I'm going to lose probably half the class, and I know then some of the other ones, are you guys are going to meet upstairs? The the Van Horn, uh, did you guys go to the Van Horn class? I thought so you guys did. I don't uh, so anyways, they might meet upstairs, maybe in the teen room, I'm not sure. So any requests that you have for Sunday, uh, Sunday morning auditorium class, uh, we'll have some of the ladies, I know sometimes still stay in this class, but uh, so we'll have a mixed class, but uh, any suggestions, let me know, and uh, we'll put something together, and we'll start teaching on that starting Sunday morning. So being that it's Wednesday, the quicker the better on the suggestions. <laughs> Just saying. Well, if it's only going to be men, you might need to talk about how to be better husbands. <laughs> if it's going to be men, teach them how to be better husbands? Yeah, there you go. All right. Well, I could get, like, a camera and have somebody follow me around my house and be like, this is what a great husband looks like. You mean a documentary? Yeah, like a documentary, you know, like a reality show. Oh, there you go. Oh, he's the Yeah, like in-home uh, preacher reality show. You know? Sure hey, we might we might be on to something here. But it was the fact that I hung the curtains that should be, you know, what you're focusing on. And hey, they were right side, you know, front, but she I didn't have them the way that she liked to fold them, you know what I mean? So it was a little bit uh so I had, to, I had to unscrew everything and then redo them before we come. It was like 10 minutes before we were supposed to leave, and it's all hot upstairs. I'm sweating. I'm like, you got to do this now? So. Where was Jim? Huh? Where was your right-hand man? Oh, he was probably watching TV. I was upstairs in the bedroom hanging curtains. He mowed the lawn yesterday. All right, all right. They need to be turned around. Let's pull it back in here. <laughs> Let's bring, let's, let's bring it back in. Bring it back in. Yeah, yeah. All right. Kara, Kara started and opened up a can of worms there. But. Oh, it's open. It's filled out. Yeah. What? All right, Matthew chapter 20. Let's jump in here. Matthew chapter 20. We're going to look at the laborers in the vineyard, the early and the late workers. As we look at this parable, the theme on this parable is the wonderful grace of God. Okay. So just right up front, wonderful grace of God. And so somebody define for me, what is grace? Grace, what is grace? What's your definition for grace? Tom? A gift you absolutely do not deserve. Okay, a gift you don't deserve. Pat? You say it's unmerited favor. Unmerited favor. And I say unmerited favor? Well, that's good because that's what's in my notes. So at least I'm consistent. <laughs> All right, unmerited favor, John? Okay, okay. I'm going to go with Van Horn's uh, definition because he says, I always say uh, unmerited favor, right? Unmerited, undeserved favor extended to us. Isn't that what it says in Romans, that while we were yet sinners, what? Christ died for us, right? Uh, so it wasn't based on anything that we did. We didn't earn, uh, you know, the grace. We didn't earn salvation. And so grace, grace is something that we did not and cannot and will never earn. Uh, and that's why we don't. That's why we don't teach that uh, uh, that that you're saved by works, right? 
uh, as, as somebody would claim, as some people would claim about the churches of Christ, they believe they're saved through works, and they call baptism a work and not an act of obedience. And that's a whole other Bible class. But in this parable, we start to learn that our reward is based on God's grace, but it's not based on uh, longevity of service. Okay? And I say that grace is not based on longevity of service. Salvation is not based on longevity of service. So why would I say that? Because here you're going to see how in this parable you have the early workers who make an agreement with God, right? The, the, the landowner make an agreement, but then the landowner at 9 a.m. and at noon and at 3 p.m. and at 5 p.m., he sees different people that are idle in the marketplace and he sends them into the vineyard. In verse 4, it says that what is, whatever is right, uh, I will do for you. And so we look at this and we have to understand that it's talking about those who, because they served longer, they bore the heat of the day, they thought, well, if those guys are going to get a denarius, let's just say five bucks. They're going to get five bucks, right? It's easier for us to understand. Then if they're going to get five bucks, they've only been here an hour. I'm, I'm going to get something better, right? I'm getting more than five bucks, that's for sure. I've been here for 11 hours. They just got here. And so you're going to see how they thought because of the longevity of their service, the length of their service, bearing the, the brunt of the heat of the day and the struggle of the day, that they deserved more. Uh-oh. I thought grace was undeserved merit. But in, but in chapter 1, in uh, verse 1, I believe it says they agreed on a denarius yeah. for the day. And that's why I say you can throw out whatever. You can say a penny, a dollar, five dollars. All the rest of them, they don't talk about well, verse 4, it tells us. Yeah. In verse 4, it says, you go into the vineyard, whatever is right, I will give you. Right? So what did they do? They put their trust in this man who seems to be an upstanding, righteous uh, owner, a uh, landowner. Right? And so it's, you, that's where when we get to this point, we start to break this down, you're going to see the landowners who? It's God. Right? Uh, the vineyard's what? It's the church. The laborers are who? Christians. And so... Look at, uh, and, and well, let me just read this for you, uh, and then we'll jump into it. And we'll read through the whole parable, and then we'll start to break it down. But in Luke chapter 10 and verse 2, it says, And Jesus was saying to them, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to do what? To send out laborers into the harvest. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor uh, in the Lord is not in vain. So I want you to keep that in mind, right? That we are to pray that God uh, sends laborers into the harvest, right? We are to pray that God could put somebody in my path, that I could teach them the gospel of Jesus Christ. They could see the error of their ways. They could see the love of, learn of the love of God and want to repent and be added to the work, added to the kingdom and to the church. And so one thing that you're going to get out of this parable as you start to study it is that we need to make sure that when you work, that your work isn't for a certain period of time, that you don't receive payment till the end of the day. That means you don't receive payment until the end of your life. All right? Are you given eternal life on day one? Or do you get, when do you receive the reward? Don't we still have to go before God in judgment, I thought? Yeah. And so after there's a judgment, then there's a what? There's, a, there's a, a paying forward of what is owed, whether it be good or bad, right? And so we have to understand that as we go through this, and you see the late workers versus the early workers, that it's not about the longevity of your service, but it's about the fact that you serve, and you serve with the proper spirit, a proper attitude. So let's jump into it. Uh, who would like to read this parable? It's Matthew 20, 16 verses. If somebody would like to read it, Tom, Barb, either one of you. Yes, dear. <laughs> for the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. When he had agreed with the laborers for a denarius for the day, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace and to those he said, you go into the vineyard also, and whatever is right, I will give you. And so they went. Again, he went out about the sixth and ninth hour and did the same thing. 
And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing around, and he said to them, Why have you been standing here idle all day long? They said to him, Because no one hired us. He said to them, You go into the vineyard too. Now an evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the laborers and pay them their wages, starting with the last group to the first. When those hired about the eleventh hour came, each one received a denarius. And so when those hired first came, they thought that they would receive more. But each of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they grumbled at the landowner, saying, Those who were hired last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the day's work and the scorching heat. But he answered and said to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what is yours and go, but I want to give to this last person the same as to you. Is it not lawful for me to do what I want with what is my own? Or is your eye envious because I am generous? So the last shall be first, and the first shall be last. Okay. So we look at this, and as we start to break this down, we see the first two verses there. And then we get to the first two verses, you got the landowner who is what? God, right? So we got God as the landowner. Uh, the vineyard is representative of the church, okay? And then the, then the laborers would be who? Christians, right? And so laborers are those who serve the landowner. If the landowner is God, right? And then eventually we're going to see the foreman is going to be representative of Christ. And then the foreman is the one that's going to de uh, deal out uh, with the payments. That's no different than we stand before Christ in the judgment and will receive payment for either our work, whether in the good or in the negative. And so you start to look at this. Notice he hired these individuals. He didn't force anybody to go into the vineyard, did he? And so is anybody forced to be a member of the church? No, nobody's forced to be a member of the church. And so question for you, what usually happens when, somebody is, when someone is hired? Let's raise our hands. What happens when someone is hired? Is there a process? Anybody? Go ahead, Kara. Onboarding. Onboarding? Yeah, that's what. Hired, you onboarding? It, yeah, okay. Onboard him. Yeah, so you onboard them. Uh, what, what is that HR uh, word? You get all their identifications. Okay. You get all their paperwork. Okay. You get to know them. Okay. You get their resume and their application and right. everything else. So that's, there's and a process, right? Yep, and but you go over their wages, their benefits, everything. To break it down more simply, though, right, there is a, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. There's an indoctrination or something. In their case, it was probably, it's a real short, uh, go out there and pick stuff and all day long, and when you're done, we pay. Okay, and so you got a job today, description. Today you'll, you'll sign, yeah, you'll sign a policy, they'll give you a sit down with a policy manual for three weeks, read all that stuff, and yeah. give you a quiz. But and nowadays, you got to watch a bunch of videos, too. Yeah, Pam? Oh, I was just going to say, they, they pretty much tell you what to do. And okay. And then you follow the rules. So you receive some type of instruction, some type of, uh, you know, basically description of what the job entails. Then you determine whether or not uh, I'm going to agree with said uh, employer as to uh, the, the type of work, uh, what the compensation is, and then I get to choose either I accept the job if they make the offer or I look for an alternative, right? And so that's, that's really the simple process. And so in this process, in, in verse 1, we see what? That, hey, I have a vineyard. And you pretty much know the type of work that you're going to be doing. But let me tell you, just in case you don't know. And they say, okay, yeah, we'll do that. You know what? I'm looking to pay about a denarius. Yeah, a denarius sounds good. Okay, perfect. We have an agreement. Right? <laughs> exactly. But So you have an agreement now, okay? And so as you go through this uh, and you, you, you understand what the st stated expectations are, isn't that kind of like us Christians? Isn't there kind of a job description? In the New Testament, right? I mean, don't we have to enter into a covenant, a contract, an agreement with God, right? No longer to live for ourselves, but to live for God, change our ways. Go ahead. Part of this process is, you know, there are, there are good laborers there that didn't complain at the end of the day because they, were, they yep. were like good Christians. But some of them lose sight of the fact that their, their objective was to work for this master till the end. Period. Absolutely. And they, and they get paid. But when they lose track of that, object, oh, wait, there's 30 more people coming into the field. Wait, three hours later, you're paying attention to the other people that are coming mm -hmm. to the field, not to what their agreement yeah. was. 
Yeah. So and that's, that's when the worldliness creeps up. Absolutely. And, and, and there's so many, you know, most of us have you've worked in the world, right? There's so many of these stories. I can't tell you ad nauseum, like when I used to be a manager, like where people would complain about what they agreed to, right? They would complain that I don't get paid enough. Benefits aren't good enough. All these different things. Last time I checked, you agreed to it. You could have kept shopping. You could have kept looking for a different job, but you chose to accept this job. So why complain then necessarily about this? Judith? I'm from Union. Okay. That has nothing to do with what we're talking about, but we're going to save that for another day. We're not going to go down that rabbit hole. She's on strike already. And so, so as Christians... We shouldn't, expect, uh, we shouldn't expect the promised reward if we're not faithful what? To the faithful to the commitment in which we made with God. And so if God makes uh, a, a, a covenant with us and tells us what the expectation is and then tells us if we are faithful, then we should expect to receive eter eternal life, right? Well, then we know that God is a, is a keeper of his word. He is righteous and holy and cannot lie. We know that God has always kept his word and kept his promise throughout time. All you have to do is study the 15, 1600 years of Jewish history to see that God, when he says he was going to do something, he did it. Whether good or bad. You know, Deuteronomy chapter 28, the, 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 the covenants of, oh, what was it, blessings and cursings, right? Uh, the chapter on blessings and cursings. If you do this, you can... You, you'll, be, you'll be well received and you will be blessed in all that you do. But if you don't, you can expect this. And it was a whole list of the cursings and everything that would follow. So you can see that there's a correlation here between these laborers and Christians, right? That entered into a, a, a contract type deal with the employer and the employee versus Christian and God. Very similar. So you start to continue, you continue to look at this. And I want to, let's look at verse 3 and 4 now. 3 and 4 says, And he went out about the third hour, 9 a.m., and saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And to those he said, You also go into the vineyard. Whatever is right, I'll give it to you. And so they went. Question for you. What do you make of verse 3 and 4? You see, because at like probably 6 a.m. or 8 a.m., you know what I mean? Or, you know, probably 6 or 7 a.m. when they first went out. These were laborers that were looking for work. But it doesn't necessarily say that these ones are laborers. There's just people that are in the marketplace that are kind of standing around idle. Are there other vendors probably in the marketplace? Are there other people working, maybe doing other type of jobs, right, in, in the marketplace? And so you could start to start to look at this and say, well, not all of them were necessarily laborers, but you could see that where maybe earthly pursuits, God looks at it as mere idleness and compared to the seriousness of spiritual matters and spiritual pursuits. Um, it used to be that they would gather around and then come with the truck and they'd pick the ones they wanted and go yep. off. And typically they pick ones that they knew were good workers yep. that they had before. And so my thought for this group was, this group wasn't the top-notch workers. Yep. The top-notch workers had already been picked, and these were the leftovers for some reason. They had yep. either slacked off last time they were there, or <coughs> something dishonest, yep. or just not really the creme of the crop. Yeah, so what, what, and there's, there's definitely validity to that, because we know that, like, you know, I've seen it, I've seen that actually happen, you know what I mean, in, in different situations when I was in the paint industry. That's a whole other story the outside of the Bible study. Uh, Jim, you're going to say something? Well, I, I was actually going to make the, the same point Mark did yep. about the, the reputation of those workers. And then the other thing, too, is maybe these guys weren't there at 6 o'clock in the morning. Maybe yeah. they slept in a little bit. Right. And, yeah. and, and that's, and that's possible. Workers. But I want you to think of something different because I told you the landowner is God. The vineyards, the church, the laborers are Christians. And I want you to think about the work that needs to be done. What should we be doing as Christians on a regular basis? I was, I was just thinking about that. And the ones that went in first were there. And they went in and did the job. But the one who owns is God. Mm -hmm. you know, And just like our responsibility is to go out and find more people. Yeah. Okay? 
And so they may have been stragglers. They may yeah. have said something may have happened where they couldn't be there at first thing in the morning. Yeah. So he's saying to himself, I need to help these people. Mm -hmm. So let me go see if there's someone that I can bring in to help. Yeah, help. You know? But also think about it. You're supposed to be out there working and searching, looking for looking for the lost. So I got a couple other hands. Aiden and then Steve. Oh, I thought it was you. <laughs> Steve? Or is it oh, my version Sue? Says, my version says um, he saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. Yeah, idle, it's right? Simple. Doing nothing. And so they could have been there looking for work, or they could just be other vendors that maybe the marketplace isn't busy, and they're standing around, rally, not doing anything. But if you look at it through the mindset of the Christian and God, and God going out and taking, so to speak, the message, the gospel, the good news of Christ, as we're supposed to take out, you go to the marketplace where? At 6 a.m. Go ahead. Part of the other story is that when he asked the later group, why are you guys still standing around? Nobody asked me. In other words, I hadn't, I hadn't heard the message. I haven't heard the message. No one's come out to preach to me. Yeah, nobody's come to me. And, so, and, and we talked, you talked earlier, we started talking about grace. Yeah. And this is these, this is how God was basically applying grace to someone who didn't deserve it necessarily. Yeah. But that's that's his choice. We yeah, don't, we don't, it's something on earth. Yeah, that's what I was trying to say, what time said. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and you both said it so well. Because remember, it says in verse 1, for the kingdom of heaven is light. So I'm going to get back to that in a second. Uh, go ahead, Tyler. Yeah, I just want to point out that I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a, I am a landowner. Ash and I are on the mortgage. <laughs> and it's about an eighth of an acre, maybe smaller than that, an eighth of an eighth. Okay. And we do have a little garden. But so what I know is there's a, there, there is a function of time involved here. If, there's, if, if, uh, if the crop is ready to be pulled, you have to have people out there pulling it. So there's also an urgency from this landowner of, like, we need to get more people out there working. Absolutely. So he more people out, he says, Whatever the story, let's get going. Because yeah. at the end, if that's, that doesn't happen, then it rots on the vine and, you know. Well, absolutely. And that's why, if you remember, when I go back to the beginning of my notes, I looked at Luke 10 and 2. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to do what? To send out <laughs> workers, to send out laborers into his harvest. So what does that look like in the eyes of the church? What does that look like? in the eyes of Christianity. And so we, as we go through this, we have to remember that we Christians who are the laborers need to be on the lookout constantly for what? Lost souls. And so I go into the marketplace at 6 a.m. Maybe I go back at 9 and at noon and at 3 and at 5. Why? Because he's constantly, remember, the kingdom of heaven is light. And he gives a a spiritual story, right, with the physical, that you can apply with a physical application. So they would all know what this looks like because they've seen it and they experience it and they do it on a regular basis, right? That the workers that are looking for work are there early in the morning because they need to put food on their table and a denarius was worth a day's wages, right? And so they would have needed that in order to feed themselves and to feed their families and then they always received payment at the end of the day and so at the end of the day becomes the end of the Christian's life, right? Because that's the idea, that's the spiritual application of it. We, we enter into this covenant relationship with God but I don't receive payment until I'm found worthy after I'm judged right we're all going to stand before god in judgment amen right anybody disagree with that and after we we're, after we we're stand before god we're judged and we receive payment whether good or bad i'm thinking that the, the people that, that enter into heaven aren't going to turn around as soon as they get there i can't believe francis got in I mean, yeah that's a worldly thing yeah it's a worldly thing that's what was going on in the, in the video. yeah so again God, last time I checked, doesn't God desire for all to be saved? All right? And so if God is the landowner and he's going there at 6 a.m. and 9 a.m. and noon and at 3 and at 5, what's the point? The point is God doesn't desire anybody to be lost. And as uh, Tyler is saying, when it's time to bring in the crop in the garden, you know, there's some urgency there. Because if it's left too long on the vine, it starts to rot, it starts to decay, and it goes bad. So they're in the same manner of thinking. Is, should there be some urgency when we're on the vine, so to speak, and we are the lot much of the world is on the vine, the fruit is there, but you don't know when the expiration date is on that fruit, right? You don't know the expiration of the lives of those members in your family and your friends and your coworkers. So there should be some urgency because you don't know when the end is, right? 
And so there has to be some urgency. And so this is the idea that the landowner, God, keeps going back and he's trying to show us that we are to have the same mindset. And so this parable teaches us that God's invitations, invitation to mankind needs to be constant. And it's not confined to any age and it's not confined to uh, certain conditions of life. Uh, and so morning, noon, afternoon, twilight, God says we should be working, looking and keeping our eye on the prize, remembering what it is that we agreed to as employers or as employees to the kingdom, so to speak. Any thoughts? Hi. Uh, you know, I can't help but think about where you started out with grace and this definition of grace. Could you tell me Pat's definition one more time? What's the definition of grace? Unmerited favor. Unmerited favor. And if you take that unmerited favor and you turn it into this equation of the of the one day's wage, none of these guys deserve it. We not, like you know what I'm saying? Like uh, like let's say I was a Christian forever and then this guy down the street just turned into one. I see him in heaven. Neither of us are 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 owed or are uh, deserving of, of any of those payments. So, yep. I don't know, I just didn't want this to go on without yeah. that. <laughs> and, and at the end of the day, like I said, we, you know, we're looking at a, trying to look at a, a, a story about a physical, a physical story with a spiritual application, or however they say it, I always get that, I always get that mixed up and I confuse that little saying that people use. Um, I didn't grow up in a church, and so I, can't, I don't have it read on hand as readily available in the mind. But at the end of the day, uh, that's why we have to look at the, what's the spiritual application here. So, again, it's not so much about the denarius as much as it is what God has promised us. Okay? And so that's why he said in verse 4, just go out to the other individuals at the various different times. Just go out and whatever is right, I will pay you. And so the, the landowner, God, he gets to determine what's right. And so when you go before God in judgment, you're going to stand there being judged for everything you've ever said and did, right? And that's why in Matthew 25, it talks about, well, uh, Jesus said, I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty. You gave me something to drink. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick or in prison, and you, and you visited me. What was the point? The point is that when you go through and you look at the love, the grace, the mercy, and the compassion of God, we are to do that to others. We're supposed to show that same type of example to others that Christ gave for us. And as we do that, what? We're going to see that we're built, storing up treasures for ourselves where? In heaven. In heaven, where we're supposed to store up treasures. So don't get caught up with the denarius and, and, and the, length, the length of service and other things because we're looking for the spiritual application. And I think sometimes we get caught up in the weeds of the physical application and what that really means when we're really trying to pull out that spiritual connection. You know, there's a reason that do not covet was in the Ten Commandments. Yeah, exactly. And we tend to get ourselves in trouble, and one of the things that interferes with us getting our reward in heaven is what happens when we start to compare ourselves to other people. Yeah. Well, so-and-so down the street's got, you know, more money than I do, or, or you know, he hasn't done any of the work. Like, it, it, like this parable is the reason all the HR departments tell you not to talk to your coworkers about whatever to get paid. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. It, it, it's because we start to compare things, and we're like, yeah. well, that guy doesn't do any work. Mm -hmm. I did a whole bunch more work than he did. I should get yeah. more. We yeah. forget sometimes that we have that reward coming. And if we didn't know any of that, we'd be totally happy with that yeah. reward. And we're going to start to look at this as we get to the end of the parable. You're going to start to see that human beings, mankind, we have this like this set of like checks and balances and what's right and what's wrong and what we determine as right and wrong in our minds. And, and so now all of a sudden, how is that fair? He only worked one hour. I've been here for 10 hours bearing the heat of the day. How is that fair? And he says, he says, friend. And he doesn't mean it as like his buddy. He says, friend. He says, did we not agree to a denarius? I have done you no wrong. If, if, if your eye is spiteful or jealous or envious because my heart and, and I is generous, that's on you. Can I not do what I want with what's my own? Judith? Um, Dr. Wayne Dyer, I used to read his self-help books. And uh, one of the sayings that stuck with me in one of his books, if life was fair, the worms could complain. Uh, if life was fair, worms wouldn't get eaten. Okay. And, and I understand. I understand the analogy. I do understand the analogy. So, 
as you, let's look at now five, six, and seven, because I want to, because we only have 15 minutes, and I got half the parable to go. So we're going to speed this up a little bit. So five, six, and seven. And again, he went out the sixth hour, which was noon, the ninth hour, which is 3 p.m., and he did the same thing. And then about the 11th hour, 5 p.m., he went out and found others standing around, and he said to them, why have you been standing here idle all day? And they said to him, because no one hired us. And he said to them, go into the vineyard too. And so again, these are individuals who put their trust in the landowner who must have been known as an as a upstanding, righteous individual. Because if you didn't know this individual and you just say, hey, just go out into the field and work, okay. But you never actually made an agreement and you don't know if he's going to keep his word, you may have just done some free work. You may have just did some volunteer work, right? But we know that the idea here is that this man must be known as an upstanding, righteous individual that can be trusted. And then you can see what happened with these various individuals as the last started to come in that were sent out. And then all of a sudden, they're receiving what the men received that went out early in the morning. And so these laborers, they're coming at all different hours. You know, like I said, 6 a.m., probably 9 a.m., noon, 3, 5 that represents people being converted to Christianity at all various different seasons in their lives. I've actually heard people and Christians say, it's not fair, like deathbed confessionals. You guys ever heard the deathbed confessionals uh, conversation? Right? It's not fair that somebody's on his deathbed. He could just, into, uh, he could just uh, say, God, I forgive, uh, please forgive me of my sins, and then I get baptized, and a day later I die. I've been serving for 35 years. Does that sound familiar to what we just read? Sounds like the Well, does it sound like the first laborers? Yes. Who agreed for a denarius? Aiden? I was going to say, it doesn't really matter like, how long or like, you've been there or whatever, as long as you got that. And have the right state of mind. If you're thinking like, oh, I've been working here for like, or like been in the church for 35 years, this guy just got here two days ago, ended up dying, then you, don't, you already don't got the right mindset. Yeah, you don't have the right mindset, you don't have the right heart condition, and that's absolutely true. And I, and I love that you, actually, you can see that out of there because that, that's, that's what we're looking at here. And so it shows that in the marketplace, many are doing different things that could be considered idleness. And so you have those laborers, but you have other people, because remember, it's not really about the laborers, right? The laborers are just those are like who are representative of the Christians who go in. But as we deal with people in all walks of life, you're going to deal with people with all different backgrounds, and I've said it before, only God, through Christ Jesus, can bring certain groups of people together. Right? You guys remember the Jews and the Gentiles? They were best friends. They loved each other so much. No, they wanted to kill each other. They hated each other. Only in Christ could God bring those people together and then have them call themselves brothers and sisters. Jim? I, I was just sort of thinking about that. You know, the, the, the point that their attitude changed was, was after that reward started to come when they were, when they were getting called in and saw the, started making comparisons. But I, it, the parable doesn't really call this out. But, you know, I, I've been, like, uh, part of a moving party, helping people move, right? It's usually me. But, you know, I, I'll be there from the very beginning, you know, loading boxes, loading the truck, and we're moving all the, all the heavy furniture is done. And then, like, at some point, at every point during the day, when somebody else walks up to help, the attitude is always like, yes, reinforcement, fresh arms, fresh legs. Like they, yeah. they're, you know, like that. It, it, I look at it the entire time as well. They were leaving the burden on me. Yeah. Because now we have more hands. Now the work's spreading out. Now the work's getting easier because there's more people in that line passing stuff around. And that's a proper attitude, proper mindset. Versus the other one, Pat. Go ahead. I like when Pat raises his hands. Because <laughs> I've also been part of some moving operations, and maybe sometimes I was the person who showed up late. And I've also heard, "Oh, now you show up." Yeah. We said you're like the callous you show up when your work is done. That's the way we said that. Yeah. <laughs> I think I was on that same move actually, and I heard both. Com and I think I heard both comments. Because I remember, yeah, I remember specifically we were walking up the stairs with a dresser, and my knee was about to give out. I'm like, it ain't, it ain't going up. Like, it's, somebody's gonna have to take this load. <laughs> but no, that's funny because <laughs> we'll talk about that after. Matthew 20 verse 8. Matthew 20 verse 8. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, who's representative now of Christ, right, call the laborers and pay them their wages 
beginning with the last group to the first. And the foreman in this analogy, as I just said, it's Christ, our Lord. Because didn't the Father commit judgment unto Christ? Right? And then eventually, when all has been spoken for, and all has been accomplished, and all has been done, and all of the enemies have been put under his footstool, Jesus is going to do what with the kingdom? He's going to give it back to the Father. Right? In which he received it. And so at the end of the day, now we've got the foreman, who's Christ, and Christ shall do what? He's going to hand out... What is right to both the wicked as well as the righteous? Hard workers versus the entitled workers. The early versus the late. The early versus the late. When evening came, uh, it indicates, as I said, the end of our earthly life. And that's in the parable, the spiritual application. That's the end of our lives. And so the biggest message here may be never abandon the work that you were called upon because you thought... I've been serving the Lord. I've been serving this congregation for all these years. It's time for somebody else to do the work. And you just kind of sit back and you start to abandon maybe what you know that you should do because now it's time for somebody else to do it. When you retire from your secular line of work, do you get to retire from the Lord? No. Or does the Lord's expectation carry on? Right? Do we still not have talents and gifts? Maybe our talents and gifts change as we spiritually grow and mature and as we season in life. And so now our work changes. And maybe what I do now looks different than what I did before, but I'm still doing something. So I'm that hard work and labor in the vineyard. Sometimes you may even have more opportunities when you're retired yeah. than you recognize when you were working. Absolutely, absolutely. Prepare a place. They get a, like a they get like a twelve hundred square foot condo, <laughs> but the lo- the ones that work for you know the early workers get the mansion. No, we all get the same reward. Yeah. No, <laughs> but I like the way you think. So Matthew twenty nine and ten. I'm trying to speed this up a little bit because we're running out of time. Yeah, she's like, good. She's like, I've been in the church a minute. Matthew 20, verse 9 and 10. When those hired about the 11th hour came, each one received a denarius. And when those, uh, first, when, when those hired first came, they thought that they would receive more, but each one of them also received a denarius. So notice, no one received any payment until when? The end of their service. Our eternal reward, you don't receive the moment you go into that baptistry. Because if that's the case, once saved, always saved. And it doesn't matter what you do or how you live because you already got the reward. So you see here the payments at the end of our service, spiritually speaking, after we've been judged. And so all payments were made and all payments were in the same amount. But we need to notice though here that their expectation, those those first workers, those early laborers, their expectations led to some evil mindsets. Right? (laughs) Envy, Jealousy, petty, pettiness. And Jesus, during his ministry, and about this time, he's doing what? He's trying to, uh, this, this message is as much for his apostles as it was for the rest of his disciples. Do you know why I say that? Because if you go back to the end of the previous chapter, they're trying to figure out which one of us is going to be the greatest. Is that a flaw in mankind? Where we're always trying to figure out Who's going to be the greatest? Who deserves the most? And so it's that perverse and sinful judgments and rankings amongst the apostles and disciples with that constant kind of jockeying for position because Jesus says, uh, he's, le- he's letting them know where, I, where, where I'm getting ready to go to the Father. And they're thinking, he's getting ready to start his kingdom. So guess what? Hey, we've been with Jesus all this time. We gave up homes and, and, and everything. What are we going to get? So do you see how their length of service, they're thinking, I'm, gonna be, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna be, I'm getting something good. I'm at the right hand of the king. Did you have your hand? Uh, it's this typical worldly thinking, and, it was, and they're thinking as well at the time, and which is why Jesus is teaching in parables. Yeah. He, he, this is how they learn. 
Absolutely. So in Luke chapter 9, verse 46, we see where, the, uh, and there's, like I said, it's in Mark, it's in Luke, it's in Matthew, where the, the disciples are trying to figure out who's going to be the greatest amongst them. And then Jesus brings in the little kid, right? Uh, Matthew chapter 19, this previous chapter, you know, just before this parable, uh, Peter uh, responds and he says, well, we've given up all to follow you. What will we get? And Jesus says, there's nobody who has, who has given whether it's mother or father or brother or sister or family or, or a farm or home, and has left everything who won't, re, who won't receive multi, um, multi times more than what they have actually given up. And so, and again, look at uh, Matthew 19, 27. If somebody has that, they can read it. Then Peter said to him, Behold, we have left everything and followed you. What then will there be for us? Now read 28 through 30. And Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you that you have followed me in the regeneration when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne. You also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or farms for my name's sake will receive many times as much and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. So you see now, now where does our parable begin? Equality. The very next verse. Yep. Do you see how this parable was as much for Jesus' inner circle as it was for anybody else? To let him know that you have to be very careful uh, about looking at things the way that man often looks at things versus how God looks at things. And what does he do? He pulls a little child amongst himself. And he picks up the little child and he puts it on his lap, right? If you go and you look at the other stories, every one of them have the same thing. That you need to become like this little child, right? You need to have the humility of the, chi of the child, the innocence of a child, the love of a child, right? Because in it, especially before they get to a certain age, it's just like they would give anything. They would share anything, right? They just want to play, and they just want to have fun, and they don't understand why stranger danger. They don't understand why somebody would want to abduct, abduct me, you know, because they don't see that. They just see people as good. And, it, and why would somebody want to assault me? Why would somebody want to abuse me? I, 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 can't, I can't fathom that. They can't think of that, right? Why? Because their hearts and their minds are still pure. And that's why Jesus tells them that we need to become like these little children, the comment, and then we'll get here. The apostles in chapter 19, as well as the workers here, saw this the way they were paid as an injustice. Yeah. But in actuality, it was mercy expressed by the landowner, the vine owner, vine yeah. the vineyard owner. It was mercy expressed by God. Yep. In your analogy, it wasn't bad. Yeah. It was a good thing. Yeah, it's a good thing. So they got exactly what they agreed to, right? Eternal life. But how is that eternal life going to be tarnished if all of a sudden you're complaining in heaven about what somebody else got that you don't think deserves it? Last time I checked, son, you didn't deserve to be here either, but I let you in. Last time I checked, my blood washed, my blood that I shed on the cross, didn't it cleanse you as much as it cleansed your buddy over there? And so that's the whole point, right? The grace, the theme of this parable is the grace and the mercy of God. Sure. Yep. Now, uh, why would it be harder for him if it would be for... Because if you, when you look at the context of that, the rich man, Jesus said, go and sell all that you have, come and follow me. Oh, okay. And it says what? He went away sad. He went away downtrodden. Why? Because he had a lot. He couldn't. You know, and he's like, I, I, I can't. And I'm just going to keep my riches and, and hedge my bet. Okay. Right? Unfortunately, it's not going to work out so well for him, Tyler. I can't help but to bring up to you know my friends here that if I don't know how the Judgment Day all works, but it's interesting that they paid first the people that showed up last. I don't know why. I'm sure there's some parallel there, and one of them I can think of is you would see all the people that were there all day furious and just like fuming at the back of the line, you know, as these guys get paid. So if we get to the Judgment Day and we're like, this guy got in, Francis. You mentioned your friend Francis. <laughs> Don't say a word. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Gina and then Randy. Yeah. 
the dead in Christ will rise first, and then all who are left will be called up into the cloud, and there will be a division. The dead will rise up first, and then those who are still alive will be judged, but they'll be called up in the air, and then they'll be judged. The sheep on the left, and the, or sheep on the right, goats on the left. Uh, Randy? The workers were invited to come to work at different times. They yep. weren't all invited to come to work at the same time. Yep. Nor do we receive the gospel at the same time, to complete your analogy. Yeah. So uh, you receive the gospel early, you receive the gospel late. Thief on the cross is a good example of that. But they are all, by the mercy of God and the generosity of God, yeah. uh, able to find salvation regardless of when they were invited by the gospel to change their life. <laughs> Absolutely. Pat? Um, I know we're old. Um, it's it's, a, it's a, a worldly mindset, and it's not, I don't know if it's right or wrong. Maybe it is some wrong, but not necessarily completely. That we think that we, li- we think of that as a, a level of fairness, how much you work, how much you get paid, or something like that. And with them, especially the first, firstborn got a different portion in the inheritance. Um, and the, the, the first workers, I kind of think of along as that uh, that firstborn syndrome. I talk about this often. It's mainly because I'm a I'm a lastborn, <laughs> but but most of my firstborn friends um, often will complain about what you got, what the younger one got that they didn't get, or how things were better and how things were different. And I would say, as a as a beneficiary, so you should be you should be happy. This is what you worked for, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you were successful. But no, See, there's anger. <laughs> See, I was the middle kid, right? And so I said, they practiced on my brothers. They learned, they, you, know, you know, they learned on my brothers. They practiced on me, and they just kind of gave up on the last two, and they were just like, yeah, just whatever. So it depends where you're at in the fold, I guess. Last-minute comments. Japan? So in this particular lesson, <clears throat> You know, yep. or being happy for Christians that haven't been a Christian as long, yep. and they know, and you know, don't. You know, yeah. He was addressing. And again, remember, this is for the apostles more than it is for anybody. You remember when Peter, because I know we got to close it down in a sec, but you remember when uh, Jesus uh, was talking to Peter before Jesus ascended back, right? And uh, and and then John is kind of close by, and he's letting Peter kind of know the way that he's going to die. And what about this one? He says, you don't worry about that one. He says, you do what I say. And if I say, if, if I desire this one to live or to last until whenever, what does that have to do with you? You do what I say. Right? I'm paraphrasing, obviously. But that's the conversation that Jesus had. But Peter, in his mind, instead of just being, yes, Lord, well, what about him? Right? And so we have to guard against that what about him mentality. We, if we're faithful and true with the proper heart condition, the proper spirit, with humility and love and compassion and kindness and forgiveness, we will receive our eternal reward, which will be the reward that all should enter. And all will enter that are faithful unto the Lord. So instead of worrying about what somebody else might have or might do or might receive, just focus on the Lord. Focus on the Lord and praise with all the rest of the angels, all who enter in with you. Tom, would you close us in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity to study your word and gain a better insight on your message to us about how the Bible is your word and all the examples that we need to follow your righteous path are there if we'll use it and follow it. We thank you for David's message. We thank you for all of our many blessings that you bestowed on us. And we ask that you be with us all as we go through our week. Amen. Amen. After a hard week of preaching, teaching, I'm glad I get another month or another quarter off. You get to.